Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode five. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and you can you can locate all of those uh, links on our website, theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Jim Limber Davis, who is the founder of Liberty Defined and the author of uh, Liberty Defined and soon to be released, Morality Defined. Um, I have read Liberty Defined. It is a wonderful little introduction to volunteerism and anarchy. Highly recommend everyone take a look at it. It's supremely affordable. And he's an awesome writer. So, <laughs> so today we're going to discuss um, revolution and why it is perhaps necessary or unnecessary. Um, why you know whether it should be violent, nonviolent, or um, you know how we can approach that to transition it time that we're uh, you know we're all hoping to achieve. So um, so so I think we should first start off with uh, you know Jim. Maybe he can discuss his um, his books, his uh, Liberty Defined. And uh, explain to the readers, uh, you know, the premise and and such. So, Jim. Sure, I, sure. I, I don't mind doing that. I appreciate you guys having me on. Um, now, liberty defined. It's uh, it's the core of uh, everything. Uh, everybody likes to talk about. They like to talk about all how government does everything wrong. They like to talk about sometimes government does something right, but nobody ever talks about the foundation of why you don't need government to do anything right or wrong and that's what I lay out in it. I, I took a long time to figure that out, how to make it, how, how to understand every little bit, what liberty actually is. And most times people will say something along the lines of it's I can do whatever I want. Uh, yeah, you can, but you can't. There's always some sort of restrictions and it's always some sort of uh, um, subjective uh, determination, interpretation, I guess, of, of what it is that you think you can and can't do. And um, I go in and I write everything. I lay everything out. And I don't, I'm not like a lot of other liberty-minded authors who leave it until the last few paragraphs of the last chapter in the book. No, I write it up front. You want to stop reading that book after the first chapter? You have what you need to know. There is no having to wait and read through the whole thing, but to be appreciated if you did. <laughs> No, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy. I read through the whole book. It's a really awesome book. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, you made a lot of reference to um, to movies, which I thought was kind of interesting. That that's uh, <laughs> not something that I, I, uh, I found in other books. But you know, the the movies that you did make reference to were really freedom oriented. So I think it was entirely relevant. Um, and 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 then you have morality defined, right? Coming out uh, at the end of this month, I think. Yeah, that's the plan. Um, I'm doing the same thing with morality as I did with liberty. Uh, both of them are going to be uh, tied into one another. And um, <clears throat> I actually started writing it uh, because I got tired of hearing from a lot of people. Oh, well, uh, well, son, you'll you'll learn. Morality is subjective. You'll learn. It's it's relative to X, Y, and Z. And and don't worry, don't worry, kid. You'll get there, and and eventually you'll be with the rest of us, and you'll you'll get that. And no, I no. Um, Morality is anything but uh, subjective when you, when you look at the roots of it, and that's what I've done. A lot of people can tell me, they'll, they'll give me the standard dictionary definition, oh, it's the difference between right and wrong. Hey, no, you need to understand what is what the foundation is, what the litmus test is for that, and that's what I do in, in, in this book, Morality Defined. I, I give you that litmus test, and uh, so far I haven't uh, figured out a scenario or found a scenario that that disproves this. It, it so far works 100% of the time on one premise, and that premise is if you believe life is important, starting even if it's just your own, if you believe life is, has a purpose and it's worth protecting, then morality is objective every time without missing a beat. I have a feeling like we're going to go into a morality uh, <laughs> discussion here. <laughs> Dave, you have anything to add to that? I know, <laughs> I know Dave will love that. <laughs> no, we're not. Dave's, we're, itching, Dave's itching to add something. <laughs> no, I'm not. I refuse to talk about this right now. I, I, me, me, and, me and Jim have talked about this for hours. and It's okay. Just condense that two-hour discussion into you know, a 15-minute soundbite or 10 minutes. <laughs> I, respe I respect his opinion, and I see where it's coming from, but I do not agree with it wholeheartedly. Well, explain. <laughs> I mean, this this is such a deep topic that I think we should we should have Jim on in a later episode. 
this is kind of advanced. Uh, I mean, I want to I hear what Jim has to say also. I, I, I didn't hear that conversation. You don't want to hear this. It's two hours of nothing. I don't know. <laughs> It basically Dave, comes down wait, to two, this. Wait, okay? two, hours, two hours of nothing. You're sounding more and more like a nihilist every day, Dave. You're starting <laughs> to worry me. <laughs> it's... it's uh, objective morality comes from a basis of fact or authority. Um, so you're letting someone else outside of your own self define those morals. So it's, it's one of those situations where even if someone decide something is objective, it's still subjective. And Jim's, Jim's point is that as long as... Which I don't think he's clarifying it correctly or using objective morality in the right words, but his point is, is that the base of all morals comes from human life preservation or, or life preservation. And I, I do agree with that, but they're still subjective to the, the individual, in my opinion. So. so what would you add, uh, Jeremy? <laughs> would you add anything? Uh, well, I, I'm not privy to all of the previous conversation, but I can imagine how it started to go. Uh, I, I, for one, am, am very interested in reading Jim's book because I, too, read his first one and, and was very impressed and uh, ca came away with a, a knowledge of, um, I think, the whole idea of, for me, the whole idea of wealth in general. Uh, he, he gave me a, a new... Uh, awakening to <laughs> that i you know and like i, you I said, really want to read his book really <laughs> really badly i've just got like 10 books to read <laughs> excuses, if he excuses, would record Dave. an audio book it would have been read weeks ago gotcha. we're doing it jim yes. we're doing it jim you look wow. at my eyes right now we're doing it <laughs> in you either i'm reading your book or you're reading your book <laughs> <laughs> or you're reading it for me because you're an anarchist and you don't believe in ip law so fuck you i'm reading it <laughs> oh dave well hey dave that was your f for the week look at you starting off already <laughs> um, <laughs> um anyway um like i said i i i came away from your first book uh with with not with knowledge that I had not had before, and as you described the the an analogies with uh, different movies and uh, uh, literary characters, uh, were very uh, eye opening to me. So, and I I, like, I enjoy his writing in uh, on the blog, you know, the blogs that he does and and social you know social media and stuff like that. So I'm I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, personally, I I do let I guess I lean more towards his side of the the argument in this one based on what Dave is saying. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm always looking for different perspectives um, because uh, one thing I've learned in, in my in my journey is that uh, a lot of things have to remain fluid for a while because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of information out there and uh, I, I want to I want to examine as much as possible because um, what's that what's that uh, line you know the mark of an intelligent man is being able to I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, being able to examine information without accepting it, something along those lines. I think that's so, uh, I, think that, I think so. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, like uh, I, uh, as a staunch conservative Republican at one point, I, I read, not only did I read Mein Kampf, but I have read the Communist Manifesto probably more than 99% of communists. So... And this is the portion. This is the portion where Dave insults our guest by comparing his book to Mein Kampf. And, <laughs> no, uh, no, 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 no. I that that was not ever. That, that, no, 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 no. I, to, 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 you know, the idea is to to beat an enemy. You have to know the enemy, and when you know a, a, a Marxist points better than they do, they really put their foot in their mouth very quickly. And it just it's just like when when us voluntarists debate minarchists. We could get them running in circles very quickly. They don't even realize it until later. It's because we were minarchist. At some point, everyone goes through a minarchist phase. I, I would say some people jump past it, but they see that, that phase and they go, oh, okay. And then when you get past it, you look back and you go, why was I ever thinking that? But yeah, I mean, I love literature. I really would like to have Jim's books uh, as audio uh an audio reading of him. I think he has a, not to, not to sound weird, but I think he has a pleasant reading voice. And I think that uh, if he just made a YouTube account and put both of those books up, uh, they'd get a lot of traction because they're they're uh, he's well spoken.
I'm not going to talk for him, but he's well spoken. I'll, I'll give him that. I actually have a uh, new uh, thing going on, a campaign. All I have to do, it's, it's on my website, uh, jimlimberdavis.com, where I'm actually trying to raise some money. I need uh, about $300 in order to uh, buy my own time uh, to uh, sit and record them into audiobooks. Um, take me about 30 hours worth of work, $10 an hour worth of work uh, to make it happen. But I have that link on my website. I'm actually actively trying to make that happen, but it's just a slow process. Real life has to come first. I will definitely donate uh, personally. Oh. Um, we'll put that link in the description in the video and the podcast and everything. Oh, yeah, if yeah. you'll uh, send it to me uh, on Twitter or something, Jim, <clears throat> I'll put it in there. Sure thing. So, so Jim, um, can, you, can you provide a, a deeper explanation of your perception of morality as counteracting Dave? I'm just <laughs> Stop doing this. I, I want to hear this. I want to hear this. We're talking about revolution. <laughs> we'll get the revolution. We're good. We'll get there. Okay. All right. <laughs> this is going to be two hours. You ready? Okay. <laughs> well, actually, it ties into revolution. Um, morality, take everything you know about morality and liberty. Just throw it out the window. Start over from scratch. Because I started this whole process, the writing, the understanding, the learning, everything. I started it all without actually having picked up another book on the subject. I figured all of the stuff out myself. I'm not trying to, to say I'm smarter than anybody. I'm not. I, I just refine my time and my intellect and my labor differently than other people. And I like to sit and think. So I take the time to actually do that. And I never touched a Rothbard book, never touched a Mises book, never touched any of them. The only book that I touched that was anything remotely close to that might have been um, one of Tom Woods Jr.'s books uh, in the Politically Incorrect Guide series. I, I started reading those and it was more about history and understanding why the North and South was right versus wrong. And uh, once I figured out what the liberty issue was for those two sides there, I ended up, okay, something else is wrong. I need to know what the right, right and wrong thing here is. It's, I, there has to be some concept, some sort of base foundation for that. And the foundation that so far I've come up with is that it is going to be not you go type in objective morality into the, into the internet and you see what comes up. No, get, get away from that. Put it away. Put it down. Don't even consider it. Start from scratch. Objective. Objective defined by the dictionary is a clear goal in order to achieve something. The, uh, the goal of morality is to achieve what? The, the preservation of the individual's life from what? From other individuals capable of reasoning skills. Reasoning is what sets human beings apart from other, from other creatures. It, it's, why, it's why we have the concept of liberty. It's why we have the concept of, of morality, of, of what ultimately becomes right versus wrong. Morality is about protecting the individual life. It's the preserving the individual's life from another sentient creature, from another human being. And it's a defense mechanism, first and foremost. And then it spreads out into the whole majority of the species, protecting the whole species. Um, why? why? Why is it that way? Because if we're not busy fighting each other and we're busy working together with one another, we have more time and intellect and, and ideas and energy to devote towards fighting other things that might consume and eat us and kill us or worrying about that comet, that asteroid that NASA just found a few months ago that's on a collision course possibly with Earth in the next 15 to 20,000 years. You know, Those are the things that we need to be focusing on and morality actually does that and that, that is it. The object of morality is to preserve the individual's life starting with you, you and you and me and working from there and, and that's, that's where it starts out at that that's how I base it yeah ba basically our two discussions were not they were or our discussion about morality mine and Jim's was uh, we were <clears throat> we're using the right the same definitions for most of the, the discussion and if that's what he wants to call objective morals I agree but when I'm talking about morality, I'm talking about moral absolutism and moral relativism. And there's no absolutes in this planet, this world. There's things we don't understand yet. So all we can do is use the information we have with our own eyes, the information we have with our own touch, feels, senses, and our 
relationship to others to define our own moralities. And if you can define your own morality, it's subjective. So that's, that's my only point. That's, and it's hard to argue that point. So that's, that's pretty much the only thing I had to say on it when you nutshell, if you put it in a nutshell. I can actually add on that, and I think that what you're getting at, the whole, we ha define our own morals. No, uh, the next thing that I can add to actually fix some of that to help understand, to help you understand maybe, is morality is three parts. What I just gave you was the foundation of what is amoral, the neutral. There is no, if I don't go help this poor guy on the side of the freeway who just got in a car accident, am I a bad individual for not helping? Because if I'm a bad individual for not helping, then somebody else is trying to guilt trip me, violating the non-aggression principle in order to coerce me somehow into helping that individual. Either I'm going to go to hell, or I'm not going to get into heaven, or I'm going to go to jail, something. No, no. What, by not helping that guy on the side of the road, I'm not doing anything immoral or moral. I'm doing something amoral. It neither affects that individual in any negative way through my doing, or positive way through my doing. The other two are immoral and, and, and moral. And moral, what is moral, are your ethics. It's, it's, it's morally correct to go and help feed the homeless and the hungry and, and, and clothe them and, and, and do the what would Jesus do sentiment. That, that is morality. The foundation of that is always amoral. You have to find that neutral ground. And then anything that violates that neutral ground is immoral. So if you suddenly tell me I have to go help that guy on the side of the road and you hold a gun to my head, what you're doing is immoral because you're violating my right to go about to refining my three natural resources in order to maintain and or improve the quality of my life. You're directing them under threat of, of duress, uh, killing me possibly if you're a cop. Uh, and, and that's not – no, that, that is completely and absolutely immoral, and that is the foundation of all government action and ultimately works into the whole idea of revolution. People, they don't want to go and help other individuals unless, unless they have some sort of, I guess, a cause driving them to do it. They, they, they want to free themselves of some sort of oppression, but then what do they do? They, they, just, they just turn the wheel and up pops another statue of, of a new leader, and now that's over everybody else again. And they don't take into consideration that, that neutral foundation of, of morality, what is amoral. And then when they get called out on it, they, they don't know how to explain it. They don't know how to defend it. They don't know how to, to, to bring it up. And so they just get mad. And then the shooting starts. And, and that getting into uh, what Danilo was asking a moment ago about the whole revolution thing or how it works into the revolutionary, revolution thing. Yeah, I uh, I take uh, Stefan Molyneux's approach, like uh, I think Jeremy also, uh, <laughs> the universally preferable behavior. Although um, I haven't read the book, but I uh, I kind of get the um, the gist of it through some of his uh, podcasts. Um, you know, where it's it's subjective in the sense that you know you you can't. Um, it's like everybody can't, how you say, rape each other. <laughs> you know, it's like you can't invite person to rape you, right? It's like that's automatically um, involuntary. You know, you, you, you know, if you invite someone to rape you, that's not rape, right? If you invite, invite someone to steal from you, that's not theft, right? And so in that sense, morality is, is, um, is completely, you know, I guess, I don't know. It's 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 in the perspective of of uh, the individual, but at, at the same sense, it's absolute because you know you can't w w voluntarily or how do you say you can't um, you can't invite person to rape you, right? So it's hard. It's, I mean, how would you how would you um, explain that a little further, Jeremy? Since you you're a little more familiar with his philosophy, I was going to try to follow Jim down this revolution path because I was interested in that. Um, I thought we were trying to stay oh, away oh, from sorry, the morality sorry, sorry. discussion. <laughs> sorry. No, no, it's no, no, it's fine. Um, uh, I, I'm. I, I mean, I, I'm now even more intrigued to read Jim's book <laughs> uh, because yes, the uh, the the definition of objective that he was using. Um, now I can now I can see where where Dave and him had 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 
well, problems understanding one another, although that is supposed to be the first rule of any debate or even a you know, logical discussion. Is, <laughs> we skipped uh, it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're working out the definition so you're both on the same page. Because yeah, um, yeah, mo most people, you know, when you talk about morality and whether it's objective or subjective and you get into the, conver the conversations between the moral objectivists and the either the relativists or the nihilists, um, when they say objective versus subjective, they're talking about you know more of an absolute on the on the objective side, as as Dave said, um, versus you know subjective, where where it's up to, up to the individual completely, and you know s some of them take it to the further extreme where you know everything's subjective, which is a whole other kettle of fish. Um, but no, because with, with, four plus or two plus two is not subjective, you know, but <laughs> well, that I, exactly. That's that, that's, I, I wasn't going to get into that. Uh, no, 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 I'm no. trying to, I'm trying, I'm trying to save you from this discussion, Dave. Um, we but can have it at a later date. I'm fine talking about it for hours. I don't, I don't care. I just, I, it, it comes down to what you, it comes down to this like weird thing where you're, you're saying that the species actually matters to the universe somehow. And, it's one thing to say yes, and it's one thing to say no, and who's right and who's wrong, I don't know. So, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> what, what about, I was going non-aggression. I think that's uh, that's, pretty that's, that's, put, that's, it's, that's what I preach. Just but not, just non-aggression. Simply put, you, you can involve <laughs> the non-aggression principle into whether this species is fit to survive or not. I mean, if all of the humans in the universe disappeared tomorrow. Would the universe bat an eye? Would anything we've done matter? That's the questions to answer. I'm not. I'm not a nihilist. I don't like that's that's absolutism. That's, that's the nihilism in Dave surfacing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Nihilist or absolute? They they believe in absolutes, much like Christians, Muslims, uh, atheists. I I don't know. That's so many people are afraid to say it. I don't know. That's what I, I'm not afraid to say it. I don't know. Aren't the you don't know. Aren't the nihilists like it, I don't care? <laughs> Exactly. That's why <laughs> right? I fucking like them. <laughs> I don't Not know. all I of them. <laughs> Not all of them, but the more extreme ones, yes. Um, but but na now I now I can see how the definitions phase got uh, got missed in your conversation, Dave. Because um, I was trying to talk about definitions, and you went off on your tangent about nihilism. <laughs> um, I apologize. Oh, it's okay. What what I was trying to say is with with Jim's definition of objective uh, that that he's basing his. Um, you know what he talks about in his book on that that does change things so I, I think that may catch a lot of people off guard but it, it definitely intrigues me because I, I think at least what I've discussed with Jim previously uh, I, I think him and I do think on on very similar lines um, but I'm very interested to, to see his his full vision of this of what he's talking about here um, but how, how it ties into revolution um, I, I think I think that path you're starting to go down there. I, I, I'm also very interested in Jim because uh, I don't really understand that. Do you, do you think you could uh, flesh that out a little more? Yeah, sure. Uh, the whole revolution deal, I, I think people forget what's important. And um, if, if you value life, and, and I think most people who engage in some sort of a revolution, I, I think they do on some level, even if it's just their own. But they forget to look at a bigger picture, the, the picture that they're a part of. Everything that everybody does affects everybody else. The whole butterfly effect thing, if you will. Um, I, I, for the longest time, called it the chaos theory thing with uh, Dr. Malcolm in the Jurassic Park and his whole, yeah, nature will find a way speech. But um, you know, people, they care about themselves and they forget that in order to take care of themselves, there is oftentimes <clears throat> safety in numbers. If people are left alone in order to go about their own business and to do things peacefully and honestly without actually trying to take from anybody else. Because the moment they take from somebody else, they are now a hypocrite in their, in their, in their basic amoral foundation. They are now violating that. Even if they couldn't explain their situation, explain what it is that they were trying to preserve. They are now a hypocrite because they are justifying hurting somebody else in this way that they would themselves not want to be 
hurt or held back or hindered in any way. And uh, when there's – this also goes into, into the whole issue with – with with how to deal with the current system, police oppressing you, people who are on government payrolls uh, oppressing you. Um, when is it okay to shoot a cop? Uh, when is it okay to shoot somebody on welfare who's perpetuating the system? When is it okay to shoot uh, any government um, recipient or any recipient of government uh, money? When is it okay to do that? And the the, the problem is is that according to the non-aggression principle, yeah. Any time is good if they're pr promoting it, depending on how you want to look at it. But truth be told, the four of us and everybody else who believes in some voluntarism or anarchist or anarchism in some way, they, they we're stuck at a, at a, at a, at a at an impasse here. We cannot just go out and just shoot them because then we have to go through this long, long, long lecture and we have to explain to them why what they're doing is wrong, what we're doing is right, and then they have more numbers to take on us. And as soon as we take out one of them, four more pop up. It's a nasty hydra to deal with, and so we have to put up with it. And then they hold us to a, to a, to a, to a much higher standard. Oh, well, since you took the time to think about this, then you should have thought of a – reason and uh, some better way of dealing with us than just shooting us but we can't do that how how are we supposed to think so coolly and calmly uh, under under the dress of a policeman's gun pointed at our face uh, how, how are we supposed to do that no we now we have to suffer because there are more people in favor of the system the status quo the government uh, and that counts the people who are apathetic as well there's just too many of them we cannot we cannot. So it has to be with one word and, and one mind and one generation at a time. And people in our situations, we just have to, for lack of a better phrase, just kind of grin and bear it. Um, unless you want to risk your own life to effect a greater change, but then in a violent means, and, and, and if you do that in a violent means, then what happens? There, there's blowback. There's retaliation. Um, we, can't, we can't afford that. Uh, a, a dead a dead mouth can't speak. It doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, so these things like this podcast here, the the writing that I do, uh, that's that's the best method. And yes, Dave, that's subjective. My, that's my opinion. Okay, <laughs> it's the best method to uh, work with. He and, concedes. Uh, I win. Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm yeah, kidding. I saw I'm you kidding. drinking that Budweiser earlier. No. That's two points against you. Um, free, free beer is the best beer. Screw you. Okay, only only one point against you. Uh, but um, no, that, that, gonna, that's uh, uh, one of these right here. I don't want to show it all. No, it's a free. product placement. Wait until they're paying you for that. Exactly. Um, Come on, bring it on, uh, Coors <laughs> and Miller Brewer Company. No, the whole the whole idea is is we got to get more people to to listen, and um, that's one of the reasons why actually I've been slow to do the audio books. Is that uh, I feel that uh, when we're actually having discussions, and somebody brought this up uh, just a few moments ago about uh, getting people to understand and getting people to listen, um, why people don't read. Uh, or maybe I was thinking of another conversation earlier in the day. I'd, anyway, no, I, I I prefer to write. It's um, yes, it's less personal. But uh, I, I prefer to write so that people can read, so that they can take solace in their own minds. They can read what I have to say, and they don't feel the pressure right off the bat to go and respond. They don't have to. They don't feel like they're they're being put on the spot, or if they say something wrong, or if they ask a question that everybody around them listening seems to take it for granted that that, that that's the answer and that's right. They don't feel put off. They don't feel as if they they, they need to be guarded. And so I write. Uh, for the people who are afraid to speak up, I write for the people who are afraid to to, to go out there and, and do the things that uh, that we're doing here, um, and and that's that's how I think to avoid a violent revolution, it needs to go. But it's going to be a very a very long time. Um, in fact, uh, somebody uh, quite a long time ago in the uh, maybe in the late uh, eighteen. Uh, 60s, um, I think, said something along the lines of um, of uh, of this here. Uh, My experience of men has neither disposed me to think worse of them nor indisposed me to serve them, nor, in spite of the failures which I lament, 
of errors which I now see and acknowledge, or of the present aspect of affairs do I despair of the future? The truth is this, the march of providence is so slow and our desires so impatient, the work of progress so immense and our means of aiding it so feeble, the life of humanity is so long and that of the individual so brief that we often only see the ebb of the advancing wave and are thus discouraged. It is history that teaches us the hope. And uh, that is our problem. It, basically, our problem is is that we have these ideas. We know exactly what the problem is, but we can't get our message out to enough people fast enough in order to help them, in order to help ourselves by getting them to see. And so when we don't get that message out there, I think what ends up happening is that then people are hungry and then people are cold and they begin to revolt for the wrong reasons. All the reasons that are that are caused, they're, they're symptoms of their support of the status quo of government. And, uh, and so when people revolt for those reasons, revolution becomes violent instead of peaceful. And that, that is, I think, is it not the purpose of, of this show is to prevent that? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've always carried the sentiment that apathy is the precursor to tyranny. And uh, I think that if we can get more people out of this apathetic oh, nothing's going to change idea that uh, things can actually change. But, uh, you know, violent revolution is not going to be the, 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 the fix. Violent res revolutions have leaders. They have uh, governmental structures within themselves. Uh, they're normally used to pr put in a new government. And I don't think anyone that's a voluntarist wants to just, you know, like a, 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 a dry erase board, a chalkboard, wants to just erase the government and put up another one. So we have to get people to actually realize what's going on and not just deal with it. You know, uh, I think it was me and Jeremy were talking about how it's just amazing how every revolution is just done by brainwashing people into believing that those people are bad, we're good, we're going to do better than what they did to you. And when they get in, it's always worse. <laughs> it's always worse. Um, I mean, if you just take the one most prevalent to the conversation, the American Revolution, you know, immediately after re the revolution, there was higher taxes in the United States. There was uh, a, a stronger governing body than someone 2,000 miles away in a castle in England. And there were uh, uh, more constraints on liberty after the Constitution got put in. So was it a net gain for liberty to not be under King George's rule or to have George Washington, the new king, um, be in rule? What do you think about that, Jeremy? Uh, well, the, <clears throat> the American Revolution is always one of my favorite topics because uh, it's – uh, you know, sacrilege to to question the the efficacy of it uh, to most people. Um, but what you were saying is is you know c kind of the same way I think is that you know was was it really such a good thing? Um, you know, maybe in the extreme short term, yes. But long term, look where we are now, uh, a mere two hundred plus years later. Which, in the grand scheme of time, e even in the grand scheme of you know recorded history. Uh, it's uh, it's not it's not very long, um, but most people take it for granted as it's you know is kind of on the basis of the appeal to, appeal to antiquity. It's always been here, so it'll always be here. You know, people don't want to think pa back beyond that. Um, but it, it does tend to be you know you look at the his the history of, of revolutions throughout you know what, what we have recorded to this point, and all the ones that end up turning violent. For whatever reason, you know, if it's if it starts out that way, if it's just you know, you know, whether it's a military coup or or something that just starts mm -hmm. off violent, or whether it's something that starts with just the people with the best intentions, um, but as you were saying, you know, starts to go downhill because uh, you know when you start running out of food and everything else, and and people become desperate uh, versus having a some kind of plan in place uh, when it when it when it happens to you rather than you having it happen uh, or creating it rather uh, people are, are even more desperate and, and that's when violence can occur even more quickly uh, because now, now you literally are fighting for your life 
versus possibly just fighting to change the status quo. Uh, so when that occurs, like I said, we, no matter which way it happens, the history is littered with these revolutions that, as you said, Dave, they, they end up worse than before in rather short order uh, because not enough people are prepared to live without a structure. They just, you know, it, it harkens back to, to last week's conversation with the belief in authority. Uh, people, they throw off the shackles of one master and, and very quickly want to run under another one because that's all they've ever known. Uh, and, and that's why you have these changeovers, but nothing really changes. And if it does, it's for the worse eventually. Um, you know, I, I too am of, of the mindset that we would be much, we, the collective we, <laughs> to, to use that term that we all hate, uh, would rather take the time to educate more people and have more people come to these realizations on their own so that they can prepare themselves for what life would be without that authority, without that supposed protection. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it falls down on like a personal responsibility thing where, where people would have to be more responsible for their lives. And that's a lot. Many people don't even think about that. But if they do, uh, fear takes over. And, you know, because of all they've ever known, because they've had these protections, they don't want to even think about taking responsibility for certain actions. Um, but that would necessarily be required uh, if we, you know, if the state were to fall. Um, you know, I've, I've heard both sides of the argument recently. I heard uh, Chris Cantwell talking about it on Free Talk Live uh, about how, you know, the kind of push the button scenario. If you were able to, you know, push the button and have government disappear overnight, you know, uh, what what would it be like? And uh, that could get bloody, too, because not enough people are ready. Um, you know, the, the, not enough people are, are ready to handle that responsibility. So, you know, whether a, a revolution were to take place or we could have this magical button where we could push where it would just dissolve on its own and nobody had to get hurt. Um, if that happens too quickly, uh, the chances of falling back into something almost exactly what we have now or much, much worse uh, within a, a very short time frame, uh, you know, the chances of that rise exponentially uh, with the, the lesser amount of people that are, are prepared to handle that type of actual freedom. Uh, you know, so my thought process, just like you said, Dave, has always you know, been along the lines of I would love to see the I would love to see the immediate dissolution of the state, but I fear the, the immediate dissolution of the state more. So I would rather be part of the process of, of well, the, helping educate more people. Yeah, because bring the, them along. because the state's not real. It's an idea that's propped up through the belief in authority. So if you, if you get rid of the quote-unquote state, you're still going to have a lot of statists that want a state, and they're going to rebuild one. What do you have to say about that, Danilo? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. How can, you, how can you get rid of the state when it's basically a mentality, right? Like when you, push, when you say push a button, get rid of the state, like what does that mean? Get rid of the buildings, get rid of the tanks, like <laughs> because it's all still in the mind. And, and Jim, you know, he mentioned about the um, – you know the postal workers, the people you know working in the in the in the government schools, and people on welfare, people in subsidized housing, and all that. Um, you know, are they our enemies? Like, what do we do with them? You know, <laughs> do we? You know, you, they're not our enemies. I think they are more like victims, victims of their their delusions, of their you know their their status hallucinations, which which they have been brought up to believe is real. Um, <clears throat> And and that's the problem, you know. We have to we have to try to um, <laughs> you know educate them to understand that no, the, the state is an illusion. The state is like you know just like Easter Bunny, the you know Santa Claus. It's not real. Like there's you know it's like you know without you know without government, how are we gonna how are we gonna build you know the roads? How are we gonna do all this stuff? Well, so if there's no Santa Claus, that means nobody gets presents. Like no, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> what? It's just, there's it's, no Santa Claus. It's, <laughs> Way to ruin things for Jim, I'm Danilo. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> There's I'm no Easter Bunny. Violating your nap. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so we have to, you know, if, if you don't attend to the mind, if you don't make the, um, 
you know, the, the, the gentle um, persuasions and, and make your, um, you know, write our, our eloquent arguments, you know, to people's, um, you know, delusions, then the inf there are a few things that are going to change, right? It doesn't matter who's in power, it doesn't matter, you know, a black person, a white person, a Hispanic woman, <laughs> it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know, uh, it's just, um, it's just going to be like, you know, the, uh, the broken record, I guess, you know, it's like, it's like, I think, um, there's, there's one meme where, where you see the people pulling down, pulling down a statue, and then, you know, you see the, the, the revolving statue, another guy pops up, right, from the, from the ground, and, uh, you know, when people have the status mentality, they want to be ruled. They need a ruler, right? They are, they have been bred to be subjects, to be serfs, right? And, and that's, that's what our goal is, is to, is to teach people, no, you're, <laughs> you're, you're an individual, you know, you don't need to be ruled. You have morals and you consciously made a choice to have rulers, right? You don't need to have rulers. You're, you're in control of yourself, of your morals. You have self ownership. You're choosing to be a serf, so you can might, you can just as well choose to be free, right? Yeah, it's just a choice. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, the other thing I wanted to point on is like if you look at an area that has a failed state, uh, Somalia, Iraq, kind of right now, <laughs> Afghanistan, which never really had a state, but um, you look at these areas that don't have a state, the state fails. You still have a bunch of statists in that area clamoring to prop up their own state. So you have a civil war. Like in Somalia, you have the people who want this, you know, a Muslim uh, a Muslim centric uh, authority and power, and then and the people that want more of a secular uh, uh, authority and power. But they still want the same thing. They want an authority. And. Jim, if people want an authority, there's going to be a state. And I think what we've got to do is dig deep and, and, and find out ways to spread the message of liberty that maybe a ruling class is a bad idea. Is there, is there any way that you could think that maybe what – like other than just talking about it and stuff, is there, is there any outreach or anything that you think we could do like on a real positive like, – like, it's such a muddled idea to think that we could just like buy advertisements on TV or, or, or I just, I really have no idea how to attack statism. That's the problem. Statism leads to revolutions and they're always a bad idea because they always have a net negative outcome. Look at the Bolshevik rev revolution in Russia. More people have died since that revolution in Russia than before combined probably. So, how do you get away from this notion that there needs to be a ruling class, Jim? Well, that's what I uh, actually am trying to do with the books that I've written. Um, like I said before, everybody gets into this this groove of bashing government. They, they, they like to point out – they get into the argument of pointing out, oh, the government did this and this was bad and this was horrible for society and, and for humanity. Oh, oh, but, but the government did this and it was good. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. You need to find your foundation for liberty. You need to understand what liberty is. You need to understand what morality is. If you don't understand these things, the non-aggression principle doesn't matter. None of that matters. If you don't understand that the non-aggression principle is rooted in, 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 a goal, in, in a goal to preserve human life, even if it's just your own, by not being a hypocrite and, and doing to others what, what uh, you don't want them to do to you, if you don't understand that, then it's not going to be worth a hill of beans. Um, if you don't understand that liberty is derived from morality, uh, the preservation of your life in conjunction with the preservation of other individuals' lives to maintain and or improve the quality of their lives by refining their time, their intellect, and their labor, if you do not understand that, then you are going to have another state. You are going to have somebody else. You are going to seek out somebody who knows this well enough in order to affect or extract some sort of control or power over you through uh, an underlying coercive measure. That's what's going to happen. And uh, this is why, again, this is why I write. Because you, you get into the whole uh, train of thought where you have to go tell everybody. You have to tell everybody. Just like you were saying, Dave, on your first, on one of the first podcasts you did, uh, you, you feel so excited you have to go tell everybody about this. And everybody goes through that stage. Everybody does it, even if they deny it. Um, it, they, go, they go through it, and um, my, my time for that was, oh my god, I found the fair tax. This is so great. We can make the government work and it actually work. Nah, never mind. And 
then I said, forget I had a, it. I had, a fair sta- I had a fair tax bumper sticker on my truck for a long time. Yeah, I, I, no comment. Um, <laughs> I, I voted for so, Obama. <laughs> I thought we got away from that last week, Danilo, and no, you no, had no, to bring we're, it back. We're all, we're all stating our faults. Come on. You're, come on, you're come going, on Jeremy. You're, come on, Jeremy. You are yes. here again. Come on, Jeremy. You are here, Danilo. <laughs> Now you're back down to here. Jeremy, Jeremy admit- was a part of the Libertarian Party. Come on. Admit- <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm admitting, I'm admitting to nothing. I was just gonna say, coincidentally, <laughs> That's not a Libertarian I, Party I, card. I have one. My- <laughs> I'm a registered Libertarian. I, I won't vote, but. My 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 video for the day in our our Facebook group actually was about the fair tax, although it wasn't a positive thing. So <laughs> I I admit that I admit to nothing negative. If taxes are just, then fair tax is probably the best way to go about it, but. Taxes are inherently evil. Yes. Well, getting back to the topic <laughs> at hand. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> the, uh, We're going to have to have Jim on more to pull us back away from tangents. Great job, the, Jim. Uh, the issue here is, is in order to get people to think, and people don't think when they feel pressured. And when we're talking to people, they feel pressured. Again, I mentioned this previously. The, 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 they, they build up fortifications. They, they build themselves up. They build walls in their mind. They don't want to listen. They don't want to think. They, they, they Forget it. It is much better to just continue the way things are. And you know what? If I just go ahead and I, I play by the rules, all I have to do as, 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 as a uh, claimed uh, su- a citizen of, of any government, doesn't matter what it is, all I have to do is run faster than the slowest government supporter and keep my head down and be quiet and maybe I won't be targeted. And But no matter what, I wouldn't be guaranteed in order to be captured by the state if I run faster than the slowest government supporters. And that's what their mentality is. But they don't want to talk to you or you or you or me or anybody else. They don't want to because then it makes them uncomfortable. But by putting out literature, which is, guess what? The one thing that every government tries to ban. Why? Because it gives people the ability to read the thoughts somebody else put down without feeling pressure and to do it in the privacy of their own mind and at a time they so choose to see fit in order to read it. So, again, I don't believe in the whole IP thing per se. I think that if the, you, know, you take my books – Download them, distribute them, share them, do whatever you want. I would appreciate it if people would attribute the, uh, the the knowledge within them to me, but I don't care at the end of the day. So long as they take it and they read it and they get something positive out of it, get, they get they, they get something that <clears throat> allows them to stop pushing their ideas on everybody else and to be willing to accept no for an answer. And government supporters don't do that unless get out, but empty your pockets on the way. So, yeah, love I, it or I, leave it. <laughs> I think that's a good point, Jim, um, because there's so many there's so many different mediums and, and ways you can try to get the message out there. But it's kind of hard to get more voluntary than putting a book out there for people to read, because you're literally just throwing that out there to the world and say, pick it up if you want to, if you don't want to. I mean, even with uh, videos and such. Uh, these days with most web browsers, you know, you, you open something up and the videos start playing automatically whether you want to or not. So that becomes a little, that even, even those uh, type of media has become uh, a little less voluntary <laughs> uh, with reading. It's, it's kind of hard to force somebody into that. <laughs> um, right. You know. uh, can I interject something in here real quick? <clears throat> sure. Yeah, the whole voluntary thing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to talk to a couple of uh, Walmart uh, general managers, and uh, I'm trying to get them to uh, allow me to uh, put some uh, free copies of my books in their stores. Uh, but the catch is I want to give their, uh, their elderly greeters uh, a couple of uh, AK-47s and direct them to pick up the copy and take it with them home. But I don't know if that's going to work or not. <laughs> nice. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> but the government... The government makes it work. I, I just thought I'd try their same tactics. I, I don't know. You don't have the greater good in mind when you're talking about this stuff, Jim. You, you just got to understand that we are the people, and you know, this is America. And if, if you don't love it, then you, you need to leave it. You're just a selfish yeah, you capitalist. That That's it. Down. That, that beer's got to go, pal. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not traditional 1776 Sam Adams. Put it down, please. <laughs> Well, as as Jim was saying about his you know his talks with Walmart, I, I unfortunately I don't think the the greeters with the AKs are going to fly. But ho- hopefully, you know, if you can work out a deal with them, that'd be great. Because you know, you, I mean, you started to say that before. 
um, you know, a, along with it being a, a totally voluntary, you know, action to be able to pick up your book or not and read it, you know, you are I, nice enough, in my opinion, to put most of the content out there for free. So people, you know, it's not even, a, it, you know, it's, it's so voluntary, it literally almost doesn't cost you anything well, um, except your time. What are you going to uh, you know, say about these? What are you? What are you going to say about these conservatives that have been on you about Twitter? That you're you're voluntarily here and you're voluntarily paying those taxes, Jeremy. Well, that's a whole separate issue. I'm co <laughs> I'm co I'm, co I'm coerced. I'm coerced into paying taxes because if I no, don't, no man, you choose to live here. You choose to work. Come eventually on, eventually, men with guns will show up at my house. Yeah, you have a choice, Jeremy. You either pay or you go to jail. You have a choice. Nobody told you you don't you have, have a choice, a choice here, on. man. You have two distinct choices here. <laughs> oh, you. Oh, you uh, you always have choices, but when it's when it's a uh, when it, when you're forced into it, it's a false choice. So I'm not even going to play that game with them. So okay, um, all right, let's but, let's theorize here, right? Sorry to interject, but let's theorize, okay? America goes to shit, inflation happens. Someone comes along and says, "I want to start a new America, one that does this," and people jump on, and we have a violent revolution. What's like? I can you see that happening here? Yeah, it's well, happened already, twice. This is true. I, I, that actually sounds like two separate, two, two, two contradicting scenarios. Because first you said it goes to shit, and then there's a violent revolution. No, I don't. I don't think it'll. It's already. It, it already has gone to shit. Um, so that 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 part's already covered. Could it happen here? Uh, as Jim said, it already has twice. Um, of course it could. It could happen anywhere. Uh, you know, but that's what people like us are are trying to avoid. Um, because, you know, getting back to one of the earlier points about whether it's justified to take these actions, um, you know, a lot of people have discussed this. You know, I, I'm of the opinion that as far as, you know, agents of the government, you know, even down to the low, lowliest bureaucrat, um, you know, they, they are in violation of, of, of the principle that, 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 you know, the four of us and, and many of many other people do live by. Um, so is it morally justified to go after them? I tend to lean in the direction of that it is. It, it is not, however, pragmatic uh, to go after these people, you know, as Jim had started to say earlier, um, you know, I mean, I, I would contend one of the points you had made, Jim, that we actually do outnumber them um, by a long shot, uh, not, not, not voluntarists, uh, but people that would be willing to stand up to the government should it come to pass. Yes, there we we do outnumber them. The conservatives are quite a big number. They're not exactly on our side, but they they they'd be willing to use the you know they they have the bulk of the uh, three hundred plus million guns that are supposedly in this country in the hands of private citizens. Um, but once that occurs, then we run into the issue of well, they still believe in authority, so they're going to want to run back to a state, which is why everything continues to happen in this cycle. In this cycle. Uh, you know, the belief in authority is what needs to be shaken. Uh, and, and the only way I, I can see that happening is, is what most of us have discussed so far is, is, is taking time and educating people, you know, literally one mind at a time. Uh, because and it, it will it take will it take some time? Absolutely, um, it's it's not it's not a quick fix. Um, but quick fixes are usually most of the time they're not the best solution. Um, so you know this has to be thought for, you know thought through. And you know, like I said, it while there may be justification for going after you know the the agents of government and trying to take control. If there's not enough people ready to handle what comes next, then you fall right back into what you started with, and and, and then all was for naught. Uh, you know, people will end up losing their lives for literally nothing at that point. You know, the whole idea of of most revolutions is people are willing to put their lives on the line for something better. Um, they're often misguided and misled, unfortunately. Um, but th there are those good intentions with a lot of people. But if you're not prepared for the next step, then you run into a, a wall. And once you get there, it's everybody stands around and looks at one another and, well, what do we do now? <laughs> and people that, that still want to seek out power will. And, you know, they, they'll charm their way into the, into the hearts of everybody and, and they'll take over and, and promise the moon. And, uh, if you don't shake that belief in authority, the the cycle will start up all over again, relatively quickly. And, yeah. And 
We, you know, that's what we're trying to prevent. We, you know, so the, the long-term solution, you know, I, I've, I've said many a time, you know, I mean, Jim mentioned before about what we had, we had talked about previously, you know, D Dave about the enthusiasm at the beginning and, and, you know, Jim, you were talking about it, how everybody goes through that stage. You know, I went through it too. I uh, wanted to tell everybody, and, and now I've realized. And and I also wanted to bring a quick end to the state, and I wanted I, I I wanted freedom right away, and 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 it would be wonderful. And and then you realize that well, wait a minute, there's not nearly enough people who think this way. What the heck's going to happen? So, you know, I, I resigned myself quite a while ago to never seeing the change that I I personally advocate for in my lifetime. Um, but I'm okay with that. I've made peace with that. If it comes sooner, great. I will be ecstatic. Uh, but for now, I actually find peace in the fact that I, I don't have that extra pressure over me of 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 wanting to see it and and dreaming of see it and and having that hold me back in a way. Um, you know, because as I've mentioned before, I have two I have two young girls. You know, and uh, I do this more for them than than for me at this point because uh, I, I just. It, it's it's not necessarily altruistic because I don't necessarily believe that any that there is pure altruism um, because you know you always get a uh, you get it's like that Friends episode with Phoebe and Joey where you know you get that good feeling even when you do something. <laughs> uh, I, I I believe that you know that there are there is no true truly altruistic moves because once you once once you do something for somebody else you end up feeling good about it. Up, oh, you got something out of the deal. It's not purely altruistic, but I do I'm I'm doing it for me but you know and i've talked to jim about this before maybe you can expand on this a little bit more jim but the fact that you know you're doing this for yourself but you necessarily you're trying to help them because helping them helps you um so uh, maybe you can discuss that a little more do you i mean this a while ago we've had these conversations but i know i know you and i've talked about that a couple of times uh where it's you know it's even if, even if even the selfish person who wants to do it for themselves would be well served by trying to convince others uh, to at least listen, because the quicker more people know, the, the quicker the change can happen. Yeah, that conversation was uh, about three months and a week ago, and uh, the example I used was uh, helping you have a neighbor. You both own homes. And uh, your home looks nice. Your home looks uh, really well uh, taken care of. And your uh, neighbor across the street, uh, what a dump. Um, and so you go over there. You don't charge them anything. You don't, you don't demand anything. You just say, hey, listen, would it be okay if I helped you fix this project up, fix your front porch? Would it be okay? Can, can I help you with your, with your lawn maintenance? Can I help you fix this? Can I help you paint this? And by helping that individual, you're not doing it just to help them out. You're doing it because what happens when their property looks better, when their property is maintained, your property value goes up. You're actually doing that to help yourself. Uh, by going out, and, and, and the example I was using about the, the, the moral and immoral and amoral earlier with the guy on the side of the road, no, I, I go out and I help that guy on the side of the road not because I want something from it, not because I feel good about helping this old guy out there. No, I, if, if I'm not doing it for credits, for, for, for currency, for money, for bitcoins, I'm doing it on the premise that maybe this guy here, if I help him, there's a possibility, a remote chance, maybe 0.00001% of a chance that he might in some way repay the favor or do something to somebody else who will then pay it forward. I, I hate that expression, but that's what it works. It, it will do something that might actually benefit me later on the road when I'm hurt and, and stranded on the side of the road or being attacked by government agents or am being abducted like the guy on Ancient Aliens slowly over 20 years. But um, <laughs> that, that, that's the, that's the, that was the crux of the uh, discussion, I think. Right, Jeremy? Yes. That, that reminds me of a, of a quote. I forget who said it. Yeah, he basically said, like, when they when they went after the Jews, I didn't re resist because I wasn't a Jew. When they went after the, you know, the gypsies, I didn't resist because I wasn't a gypsy. When they went, they went after the union workers, I didn't resist because I wasn't a union worker. And then they came after me. Nobody helped me because there was no one left. Right? I'm probably paraphrasing <laughs> horribly, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's. I think that that's a great that's a great analogy, Jim. You know that, um, you know, capitalism. The way I see it is is inherently win win. You know. Um, you know, transactions are always win-win. They're they're always voluntary, and if if they weren't win-win, they wouldn't take place, right? Because um, that's just the way the nature of of uh, 
you know, um, economic exchange, how, how it happens. Um, so in, in that way, it always increases the standard of living and increases the wealth in society when you allow people to freely exchange and, and voluntarily interact, you know, you always have, um, you know, societal improvement. You always have progress and technological advancement. It's just inevitable. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the government or a ruling class or a political elite or any kind of tyrant or despot or dictator or monarch. <laughs> you know, although um, you read uh, history books taught in government schools and they would like to have you believe otherwise. Uh, I, I was going to say, uh, I think I remember someone saying the other day, I dream of a world where the next time a Mussolini, a Stalin, a Pol Pot jumps up and says, hey, I want to be a ruler, they just kill him immediately. Just pull out a gun and kill him. And or, or, I mean, it's not necessary. Just put him in a padded room and he'll just drive himself crazy. No, no, no. <laughs> like, I don't understand. I'm the ruler. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah. There, there's peaceful ways. To, well, either way, that's <laughs> violence too. Yeah, but uh, you know, you're you're better off having that person out of society because all they're going to do is cause humanity to take further steps back. And I, I I thoroughly believe that humanity is moving towards dropping coercive monopolies altogether. Um. You're just seeing that how people get so wrapped up in technology, they get so in their bubble that anything that pokes that bubble or invades them, they don't want to have anything to do with it. And that's government. They, they get into your business. They, they, they have to prove their necessity. And, you know, like I was saying about Rand Paul yesterday when I broke down his – or the other day when I broke down his video, uh, you know, I was saying this guy, he may have the best intentions in the world. But if you look at the things he's saying, Hitler said the same things. We have to do this to, for the protection of Germany. Well, we have to do this for the protection of America. So there's just this whole guise that get that people get wrapped up in all this eloquent speech, if you want to call it that, and and all these blights that they put upon the enemies of 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 us. And you know, I he he said we like a thousand times in that that speech and it just drove me nuts you know and our and this is our country and well i've never ran for president i don't want to own anything in this country as far as people go so it's not our country it's your country you're the political class but you know what do you guys think about that like any anybody that tried to come up and be the next tyrant the next hitler the next uh FDR, the next uh, Abraham Lincoln, or the next, uh, I don't know, Jim Jones. <laughs> hey, you, you bring up these, these people here, and, and what is their premise? What is their platform? Every one of their platforms is constantly revolution. We need to reform this. We need to fix this. We need to go back and do this. Always, always politicians, they push a revolution of the Republican Party, of the Democratic Party, of the Big L Libertarian Party. And, and Rand Paul's current thing is his slogan is something along the lines of, like, defeat the Washington machine. So what, Rand? So what? You want to defeat something, but how are you going to defeat it? You're going to defeat it by coercing tax dollars out of my pocket. Once you get there, you're going to make changes and dictate and mandates and, and everything, and you're going to do what with my consent? Violate my consent. It doesn't matter. I don't consent to being governed. I don't consent to being interacted with. Everybody is like, oh, that's such a crap phrase. No. It doesn't matter what you want to do. Your quote a moment ago, Dave, about uh, as soon as someone pops up, hey, I think I should lead you guys and shoot them. I, I, no, I, I dream of uh, uh, and, and would like a society where it's somebody pops up and says, hey, I think I should lead you guys. And then everybody's like, eh, yeah, whatever, keep walking. <laughs> that attitude, that right there. And, 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 I, and I understand you didn't mean – you weren't actually um, advocating violence. I, I know that. Um, but uh, it's just kind of one of those things. It's always, always the revolution thing. We have to do something now. There's always an emergency. Always an emergency. Government has to create something to to um, to make sure it can uh, perpetuate itself. And uh, well, even we revolutionaries just, have to create the emergency. Right. Absolutely. They, they they have to do something. And and when there's not an emergency, 
they always they always bring find something a, a war on drugs a war on education Jews well <laughs> yeah um, you know well maybe not a war on education but if the war on drugs and the war on crime has worked as well as it has maybe they should have a war on education and we would actually have smarter smarter people out of the public schools but <laughs> yeah it's the the war on poverty is the best example you know the the mm -hmm. federal government during FDR declared war on poverty. And ever since then, war on poverty. Take out the tanks and the machine guns. It's kill poverty. <laughs> the war Working on up. poverty has had a net negative effect uh, in, in the United States. It has increased m more poor people than than uh, than it than it relieved out of that um, what they called poor or, or you know. The barrel, the bottom of the barrel of society that that they were trying to fix, and it's just they have to, you know, revolutionaries, government, they always have to make these problems that only they can fix, and and we've discussed that ad nauseum on this this program, and a lot of people just don't get that at first. They can see that government is inher inherently bad, that it does this and that, but they say, oh, but it does these good things, but. Think of any good thing that they – like there's a reason why we're all still driving on roads. It's because of government. There would be flying cars by now if there was no government. So, I mean they – there's – the best quote ever, I, I'm a, a, equivocating to Danilo. Once government gets a hold of something, it freezes in time. And that's – I know that's probably the third time I've said this on this show, but it's so true. They, ha they get a boondoggle in place. They get a, a, a problem, you know, the war on drugs – like I was telling my brother the other day, the, the war on drugs can never be won because the minute they win it, let's say the entire world says, okay, there's no more war on drugs uh, or there's no more drugs. We're not using drugs. We're going to burn them all, right? And everybody goes, yay, ho, oh, you're our leader. We're not doing drugs. What are they going to do with the DEA? What's the DEA going to do? But, uh, is it going to exist or is it not going to exist? Well, once you have so many people at the DEA on the government dole, you have that whole system of power set in place. You have that whole arm of the government that is controlling people, propping up prisons, propping up uh, lawyers, courts, drug courts, uh, police officers. Think about how many less police officers would be needed to enforce drug laws. Just think of that, especially in high drug areas where they're not doing a goddamn – they're not fixing the problem at all. They're putting a Band-Aid over it. It's like – it's like they're uh, they got the fire engine going and they're 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 trying to you know they're they're hitting the the hose on the on the on the the window of the 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 skyscraper that's blow it's <laughs> on fire. You're not you're not gonna put the fire out. The whole place is burning down. Well, they're not they're not trying to put the fire out. That's kind of the point, you know. Like you were saying that it's not even a matter of what would they do. They they haven't even thought that far ahead because they have no intention of of getting rid of any of any no, of these agencies or programs that far. Go, well no they could they choose not to um going back to you know there's always a choice uh but you know government it's it's the old government government actions are the ultimate broken window fallacy everything they do you know we have to start the fire to make to, to put the fire out to improve things yeah, it doesn't work like that. It never does. Um, but most people fall into that trap because, you know, as you said, Dave, you know, I, the problem, well, part of the problem is that most people don't don't believe government is inherently bad. At at best, most people believe government is neutral. A necessary, and, necessary and, evil or whatever. Well, no, they believe it's a necessary evil, but most, but even people that will say that, a lot of them would, would still say at best government's neutral and it does some bad things, some horrible things, but it still does the good things. It's not that it's necessarily, and you know, like I said, it's it's semantical with these people. But even the ones who say it's you know it's necessary evil, they don't really believe it's evil. If they really believe that, if they really believe that it was evil, and they still weren't trying to put a stop to it, what does that say about them? <laughs> you know, um, of course, it's uh, so so. Yeah, the, those those quote unquote wars on whatever are never going to end. They may the targets may change, um, but they're never they're they're not supposed to end. They're there to help government perpetuate itself. Because the, in the end, that's all forms of government. That that's its main purpose is to keep itself in business. And how do you do that? By creating problems and then make and, and presenting the appearance that you're fixing them later on. 
Um, and if you're good enough at it, the majority of people won't realize that you created the problem in the first place. That'll just go right over their head. Um, or if you know, you've been at it long enough and you've learned from other uh, empires, uh, you do what the, the US empire has done, which is drawn things out on a much slower pace than anybody else has before because they've learned f over time. They've seen what the, what the quicker revolutions and the quicker um, reforms have done. Uh, you know, when you try to take too much power too quickly, bad things usually happen. Um, you know, so that they're, you know, everything, everything evolves, including government, and they've gotten smarter, you know, which is what we're up against, because now they, they do these things on this slow pace. And, you know, even information that that comes out that it should be harmful to government, you know, you know, horrible atrocities. You know, the, the U.S. government has become really good at, at letting those things stay hidden for 25, 30, 40, 50 years under the guise of classified information that the point when it finally gets declassified, you know, four or five decades later, uh, it's a new generation who can automatically be won over with the, oh, that was just the way it used to be done. It's not like that anymore. We're different now. We're kinder. We're gentler. Um, and, and, and it continues. Um, we, we, we just shoot Iraqis and pee on them. It's so easy. But uh, what do you uh, what do you think about David Cameron saying the other day that conspiracy theorists and I believe anti-government people, or however he phrased it, should be treated uh, like terrorists, like ISIS? I believe he said. What do you guys think about that, Jim Danilo? Wait, wait, say, say it again. What, what did he say? Conspiracy people should be treated like terrorists. Yes. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's kind of a. Uh, convenient marginalization of uh, people who actually, you know, engage in critical thinking. Um, but, but referring back to the war on drugs, you know, you were referring to it as a, as a failure. I actually think of it more like a success. <laughs> if you think that they are actually intentionally trying to expand the government and produce more, um, you know, agencies, you know, in that sense, it's a smashing success. And, um, and w well, one question I have in my mind, which, which I'm not entirely sure of, is are politicians stupid um, or intentionally evil? See, that's <laughs> like, do they, do they actually know what their policies are doing to the country or do they? I mean, I think they, they see a are system. They just ignorant, you know? I think they see a system that they can abuse to their own benefit and they're not really thinking about good or evil. They're thinking about if I get in there, I can get things done the way I want or I can give sweetheart deals to my family or my friends. So it's, I mean, Jim could probably touch on it better than I can. Well, I'm about to do something that's going to make me a very big target in uh, the uh, liberty community. Uh, I'm about to go after uh, Julie Borowski, libertarian girl, nice. Austin Peterson, and a handful of others. And I'm not going to say these remarks, make these, because I think they're bad people. I think, I think they're just fine, and they're, they're wonderful gateways to, to real liberty but they are only gateways and I think they have they suffer from the same issues that uh, politicians that Danilo was talking about suffer from they are not inherently evil they're not looking to, to do anything negative or bad they're simply gateways and they have stopped advancing their thought in order to profit off the people who are currently listening to them and that is their issue Julie Borowski profits as she has to. She, she, she makes these videos and she has to have some sort of income coming in from YouTube and from the other things that she does. She makes wonderful videos, but she still supports government. She, she makes comments on her Facebook page. Well, it's just rude not to talk to cops. I'm sorry, but I didn't initiate that aggression and I didn't agree to, to this. But the only reason I pulled over for that, for that officer was because I know that he would somehow feel that it was justified to escalate the amount of violence he was, he was using on me from the threat of such violence, if I don't pull over, to actual violence and maybe even pumping 33, 34 shots with some of his buddies into my windshield if I don't stop. Um, the same thing with, uh, with Libertarian Girl. You know, it's not. They stop and they profit off this stuff. There, she's she's in with the Republican Party and stand with Rand and all of that. Last time I looked, I don't know if that information is still up to date, but uh, you know, it's not. They're bad. They just they they maybe even succumbing to the lure of power and attention 
in the case of the three individuals that I've mentioned, um, who are not actually actively seeking office so far as I know, they are just enjoying the power trip, the power ride, even if they don't see it. But as an outside observer who has none of that fandom, that's what I see. And I think the politicians are the same way. Uh, Todd Young, uh, a representative from here in Indiana, and uh, another fellow, I can't remember his name, but a few years ago, both of them have said to me in my face or, or in earshot of me that uh, it doesn't matter if you have kids in school or not in school. You are responsible for paying for the education of others because it's a, it's a, it's a total net gain benefit for the whole of society. I, no, it's not. No, it's not. You're, you're creating dependence on, on, on individuals. And uh, actually, this kind of ties in uh, to the previous uh, statements here about the uh, revolutions and how, uh, and how uh, it's not uh, working because they're all government controlled the, with the war on drugs and stuff. And the government has to control its own revolutions. And in uh, 1866, uh, before the uh, Federal House of Representatives, Indiana uh, Representative Daniel W. Voorhees uh, made this statement in a speech. Uh, concerning the American Civil War. I said, uh, or the War of Federal Aggression, I should say. The Civil War to everybody else, I suppose. Um, much the War of Northern Aggression, bro. Uh, no, be, it, well, it's going to be a uh, War of Federal Aggression because the federal government instrum implemented I'm the from thing. Alabama, okay? It's the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, Alabama can just it. So, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He, 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 he censored himself. <laughs> yeah, time. no, I... Uh, anyway, so uh, Daniel Voorhees said, Much pathetic eloquence and many bitter, te bitter tears have attested the world's sympathies with Poland. At the time, Poland was going through a revolution. Uh, with Hungary and with poor, poor Ireland, and maledictions attend upon their destroyers. But with what curses of indignation would an enlightened posterity and an impartial history assail us for blotting out by sheer force of arms a nation of our own kindred who simply desired to possess their own in peace and leave us to do the same? And that revolution right there, the, the the war of federal aggression, the American Civil War, the war against Southern independence, however, whatever you want to call it, the war between the states, that right there is the most important event in American history that that people just gloss over and they don't take into account. Because what would have happened if that if 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 the Confederacy were allowed to su to succeed to secede? What would have happened? That would have built upon the precedent of 1776. That would have built upon the precedent that Murray Rothbard uh, talked about in one of his books, where if 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 the 13 colonies could not succeed from England, from, from the empire, if, if, if the states could not succeed from, from the union, if the county cannot secede, if, what, what, what would stop the individual from, succeed, from seceding? What would stop that? And that would have set the precedent right there. But instead of studying this history, we're busy fighting each other and not paying attention to the crooks uh, giving us orders and making laws for us. Uh, we're, we're not. Instead, we're, we're, we're left with arguing and bickering about what is okay and what is not okay. And, so and them gays be, get married. Exactly. And, and we, should be, we should be asking about, well, the founders, uh, you know, they, they, they were so preoccupied at the time with what they could have done. It, it, they could have done so many other things. They could have set a better, a better precedent, a, a better foundation, a stronger foundation that didn't inv involve violating people's consent to being governed. But they were so preoccupied with the thought that they could create a constitutional republic that they didn't stop to think if they should. And then the war of uh, federal aggression, 1861 to 65, happened, and it failed. It failed, and people don't want to talk about that war because it's slavery. It's always slavery, but it was not. If you go in, uh, one of the first articles, uh, Section 9, Article 1, I think, uh, of the Confederate Constitution banned slave imports from every nation in the world except for one, and that nation was the United States. Why? Because the United States uh, economy was still heavily dependent on uh, slave uh, imports and trading. Uh, a lot of stuff was, and so that was the only nation they didn't. But nobody brings that up. Everybody wants to say it's about, about, about African uh, servitude, but they don't bring that up. And, and, and that, that's the cost of, 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 of violent revolution right there, is people don't know these things. They don't look at these things. And we, we, we lose. Now we're having this discussion here, uh, hopefully hoping to op open up some eyes and plant some seeds and to get people to read more and to think. And um, we, should, we should not have to be having these conversations. We should be out enjoying the time with our family. You guys should be. Uh, I, I should be huddled up in my corner here uh, in the dark and uh, hiding away from the world, practicing vampirism, writing my next uh, novels, uh, my next science fiction novels. But uh, that, I think that is the issue. But anyway, so now I'm going to have Libertarian Girl and the rest of them attack me. 
Do you Maybe. think uh, that those people... T- tag you... me in those discussions, Jim, okay? <laughs> Do you think right. that those people are being instructed to be gateways? I, I don't know. I... I... I, I, I'm not, I don't have anything against them whatsoever. I, I don't know that they're being instructed to do anything. I think, I think they legitimately believe what they believe, and they are just stuck right there. Again, I just see, just from my perspective, I think they are just sitting there. They are just sitting there. Maybe, maybe they really do. I, I think John Stossel, one of them, I think he really is a voluntarist and anarchist. I have followed him a long time since he was on uh, 60 Minutes or ABC 2020 or whatever it was back in the early 90s and late 80s. I remember when he was a reporter, I was like six or seven, and I remember seeing him uh, do broadcast from whatever state he was in. All the way in Atlanta, they would air stuff, air clips down there. And um, I, I would see that, and, and I, I think that... He specifically is protecting his career in order to continue doing what he's doing with Fox News. Um, but uh, I, I think the rest of them, they don't particularly have careers. I think they just want a larger audience. And I think in some way they are profiting. If it's not financial, it's definitely fandom. Because that's, that's one of the things that, that really makes me such a huge uh, Judge Napolitano fan, Napolitano fan is, you know, the other day I was watching some videos of his and someone just flat out asked him, hey, are you're kind of an anarchist, and uh, he just st- stood there and didn't say anything, and everybody was laughing, and he said, you don't hear me denying anything, do you? <laughs> but uh, Well, I, I think, uh, you know, what, what, what Jim had been saying, you know, well, the, the question had been raised of, of whether, you know, the politicians are doing this uh, intentionally or, or, or not. Um, you, you know, I, I think along the lines of what Jim is saying about, you know, these particular celebritarians, I guess we can call them, uh, or anybody like that, or the politicians, <laughs> <laughs> or, or, oh God, that book you showed me, <laughs> um, the, uh, or the politicians would be, you know, I, I, when I think of that idea, to me, it's, uh, there's like a fine line between incompetence and sociopathy. Um, unfortunately, and I, I don't think all of them know, um, it may not even be most of them know what's actually going on. They may have those good intentions, um, but they're willing to play the game and compromise their principles in order to purportedly get what they, they think they're after in the first place. Um, but I don't think it matters whether whether it's whether it's ignorance or or malice. Um, the end result is still the same, you know. So, what you know, it, it's a matter of what we do from here. Um, you know, are they? If they're, you know, like does does it make it any? Does it make it worse if they're doing it on purpose? You know, I don't I don't really think so because it's <laughs> we're still we're still ending up in the same spot. Um, you know, I can't speak to any, any of the folks that have been mentioned personally, but, you know, they, they could just very well be stuck, like Jim said, um, you know, because a lot of people do that. People who start on the path to liberty get stuck in minarchism because there's those couple of hangups that you just can't get past. Maybe they're legitimately there. Maybe they just, they can't fathom a, a, world, uh, a world without the, the U.S. having their own national defense. You know, that's a, a big hang, that's a big last Government hangup. Is- Government is bad. It should only do the important things. <laughs> of course. But um, yeah, the, of course, we know that to be true now. But, you know, that's the that's the last hang up for a lot of people. I know it was for me. Uh, you know, I think I mentioned it before. It wasn't until I, I got a hold of uh, Chaos Theory by Robert Murphy that I started thinking differently about that. Um, so they may they may legitimately be hung up. Um, but, you know, because of their status, uh, I, I think they are also they can be important conduits for people like us um, who want to push the idea, push the ideas to their logical conclusions. And we want to get that message out there. Um, Yeah. Engage in them, you know, engage with them rather. And uh, you know, you know, try to make, try, try to make them think, Um, you know, (laughs) so, you know, Jim said about if if they're going to come down on him. Yeah. Well, I mean, we don't know. I I, I know I personally don't care if people do that to me. I'm pretty sure Jim doesn't really care if they do to him. He's just he's just speaking what he he believe what he knows to be the truth, and uh, you know I, I've said it before. It's especially with people like that. If 
you draw their attention. Um, you know, I mean, obviously going out and just calling them names and, and attacking them is, is, is usually a bad idea. That's just for the people that, that don't care whether they get positive or negative uh, attention and are, are just seeking attention, period, um, and usually aren't trying to affect any real change. Um, but for people like us that, that are, are trying to affect real change, then people with that type of status and, and that type of fan base uh, especially in the realm of social media, it's. I think it's always wise to to engage people like that, um, because for me personally, it's you know as I've said before, it, it's usually never the person I'm directly engaging that I'm actually interested in in talking to. I'm talking through them to everybody else that's watching along silently. Um, you know, so when you have people that have that kind of fan base and have those kind of numbers, especially, you know, like I said, on the social media sites, you go there and engage them with your ideas and challenge them and, and, or get, or even, or even write something to get them to talk about you. Um, you know, that's a whole new set of eyes that, uh, are going to be looking your way and who knows how many of them are that close to the edge where all it will take is one little bit of knowledge that you've crafted yourself um, that they haven't heard before that will be that, you know, that, that final, the final straw that breaks their, breaks that mentality in them. And they, they have that aha, that aha moment, you know, that's what, you know, I truly believe everybody has that in them and uh, it, it comes at different times in different ways for just about everybody. Um, so you just keep throwing stuff out there. So, uh, I, I, th I think it's like I said. It's I think it's it definitely doesn't hurt to engage them. <laughs> and the one thing I the one thing I will say uh, to Dave's uh, question <laughs> uh, about David Cameron, uh, I don't particularly care about the man. Don't particularly know know the man. Um, but as a hat tip to a fellow podcaster, Dan Green of the Greening Out Podcast, I will say that David Cameron is a ridiculous human being. Um, well, uh, I just got one thing left to say, and it's an Adolf Hitler quote, and I put it on the Twitter the other day. And it is so insightful to see how he viewed people. He said, it is fortunate for governments that men do not think. Oh, yeah. Quite right. That is it. Quite right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I'd like to um, you know, go back to what, what Jeremy was saying about uh, politicians. Like, it doesn't, you're right. I think it doesn't really matter the intentions like whether they're good or bad or or ignorant or stupid you know it doesn't really matter it's just the effects is what matters and that's what everyone feels that's what we're living through that's what you know people are suffering from um and and that and this is the primary reason why we have to convince people you know that it is wrong to to say these this class of people is is has the rightful authority to rule over other people, right? Against such, against their such consent. old thinking, isn't it? I just feel like it's such old thinking. Against their consent, yeah. And and like I I love the phrase, you know, the road the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? And and then you have the Murray Rothbard quote, which is um, it's no, how's it go? It's it's no um sin to be ignorant of economics, but to ha but to have a vociferous opinion. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's harmful. It's harmful. I messed it up, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think you know it, what you're talking about. And, is and that's the problem is that is that so many people who have not done their their own thinking and analysis and um, and come to their conclusions, they 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 do actions that they think are innocuous and harmless, like voting, like supporting a politician. You know, they think how can that be wrong? How can that cause harm to my neighbor? You know, how can you know, paying tax, my, can't pay my taxes. How can that end up in the drone strike of someone in Yemen? How can how how can that happen? I I had nothing to do with that, right? Um, and uh, and it just it just takes some simple simple logical um, deduction to realize how um, inherently evil and wicked those actions can become, especially in the people who are ignorant of the effects of those actions. So um, so so why don't we finish up with some closing remarks? Um, Jim, uh, what, what do you have to say to our listeners before we sign off? Well, uh, there is zero accountability in, uh, or zero nobility in protecting something which you cannot control and justifies the consent of another outside of the realm of your own self-defense. It doesn't matter what kind of good deeds you want to perform with government. You can no more control it than you can give life to those who've unjustly received death. Great. Nice. I enjoyed that. 
<laughs> I guess I, I'll, I'll finish off um, to just to touch on something else Jim was saying before. You know, part of what we're up against is people not understanding history and, and, and understanding how close we came to having something completely different. Um, you know, like Jim had said, you know, even even during the, you know, I, I refer to, to the wars of northern aggression, but that's just me. Um, well, I, actually, I guess that's me and Dave. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, 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 this, if the South had just been allowed, allowed, allowed to secede, you know, what, what, kind of, what kind of world do we be li- living in now, you know? And, but people don't want to see that because of, of what they've been taught runs counter to that very notion. And that, I fully believe, has been done by design for a very long time. Uh, the history all of us have been taught has always been whitewashed. Um, and that's what the majority of people choose to continue to believe because they don't, because of the, the inherent belief in authority that has already been, as we discussed last week, in a lot of instances, literally beaten into them <coughs> as children, um, they are they are automatically going to accept what they were taught in school as coming from an authority so they won't question further. So they won't look at these other causes and the other possibilities that could have happened. And why is it not, um, wh- wh- why couldn't the South just have walked away? Um, what was wrong with that? How, h- how do you square that with the fact that how, how th- that's how this con- country was created in the first place, was by a secession? Um, you know, how is that, you know, again, tying into something we talked about in the past couple of weeks, you know, how is something right one second and wrong the next? How do you make that distinction? Um, but people don't want to even begin to think about that because, you know, that's that's pulling a, a, a yarn on a, on a sweater and that's going to start unraveling in a hurry. And that's sca- that's a scary proposition for a lot of people. Um, you know, they they don't it's it's very it can be terrifying to have your entire world crumble um and and that can literally happen you know it it i think to some extent it happens to all of us when we when we start down this path and and then we make those connections it it kind of has to because every you know when you learn that virtually everything you know is essentially a lie or or a half truth at the best uh it's kind of hard not to rock your foundation it's that red pill <laughs> Yeah, you know that. Yeah, that people use that 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 term a lot, um, and it makes sense. You know, once you take it, it there there is no going back, um, and it can be scary. But that's that's why education through you know the, all the different methods that we use and other people use, uh, it, it's really it's the most effective tool. I think you know is, you know especially to touch on you know what we what Jim had said and what I, I remarked on earlier about the, the writing it. And just putting it out there and giving people the opportunity to pick it up and read it on their own and, and process it at their own speed um, and hopefully make those connections. Uh, and, and we just got to keep pressing on because uh, uh, it's it can only get worse if we don't if we don't do anything. It's it's not going to get better on its own. And uh, that, that's you know I try I try to live my life that way. I I try to I try to teach my girls what I can. I try to engage people when I can, um, and uh, we we just have to keep trucking along. <laughs> that whole one mind at a time attitude. That's uh, yeah. that's pretty much it. Well, uh, I don't have much to say in closing my remarks other than uh, you can always find our episodes and past episodes at thesuitsofliberty dot com. I really appreciate Jim Limber Davis. You can find him at jimlimberdavis dot com and at liberty to find on Facebook and Twitter, I believe? Yeah, uh, facebook.com slash Liberty Defined okay. and at Jim Limber Davis on Twitter. Okay, both both of those are really good uh, wells of knowledge. So um, I have nothing else to say about the matter. Revolution is always a bad idea. You can see it through history. Just open up a book. See if the outcomes of what occurred is better or worse. I mean, King George wasn't reading people's mail. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, he didn't have the technology for it. but <laughs> Before you got on a ship to England, he didn't have a soldier with his hand down your pants. So. I, mean, I think Stalin, King George, and Pol Pot would be 
green with envy at the uh, what the NSA is capable of doing today, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I think especially Joseph Stalin or, or Lenin or uh, uh, Mao <laughs> would have loved it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know. I think we should um, we'll, we'll post. I think um, I, I think it was Dave that posted a, a quote recently about um, how revolution is you know when a regime changes and, and changes into an, another you know authoritarian destructive regime and it it revolves around a core that never changes right uh, i forget i forget uh the quote but we have to find that i think that's an awesome was quote. it my quote I, either you or jeremy posted that quote i saw that somewhere um yeah so I, I i gotta look for that one um but yeah it's basically you know that that's the gist of it um you know revolutions are like a wheel that just turns and and you know we always find ourselves back from where we started into another authoritarian regime um that's uh founded in uh you know statism theft and slavery things like that <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much everyone for listening to the seeds of liberty podcast thank you uh jim limber davis for coming on uh it's been um Wonderful show. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Take care. Peace. Bye.